um, as Tom introduced me, I came from really a uh, mixture of background, uh, and I think that is probably a really key thing for uh, primary healthcare research. I uh, need a really a multidisciplinary approach. So I have been trained as a biomedical engineer, and I did another degree in public health. So I'm, I'm currently working between the two fields, using technologies to strengthen the uh, healthcare system or primary care system in China. Um, so I do have a, a few titles, as you see from the slides. Um, but basically, the one I really want to highlight to you is that primary health care is a really key research area for the George Institute in the next five years to achieve our 2025 strategies. So I just recently appointed as a, a country coordinator to work with my colleague in Australia, in India, and in the UK to develop global strategies in primary health care of the George Institute. I think that's a really exciting role. I'm really excited about that. And I'm also very excited that I, if we can bring any resources from the other countries into this program, I think that will be really great. Uh, so just before I introduce the primary health care system in China, I probably just give everyone a really brief introduction of the George Institute. As you probably know the George Institute, and you probably not, I just give you a really quick introduction of the organization. Um, so we are a um, global organization, uh, and we established uh, the organization back, to, back in 1999. So this year, it is our 20 years anniversary. Uh, and in the past 20 years, I, I would say we grow really, really fast. We expanded our uh, offices uh, in, from the headquarters in Sydney, Australia, expanded to China, to India, and to the UK. And um, currently, we do have around 700 staff across the globe, um, and uh, with projects conducted in more than 50 countries in the world. Uh, and i just give you a really um, brief number from last year, 2018. Uh, we have a revenue more than 100 million Australian dollars uh, coming from different funding agencies uh, in different countries. Um, and um, also, as part of the George Institute, we also have a social enterprise of the George Institute. The aim of setting up the social enterprises is to, uh, is to provide continuous support back to the George Institute to allow continuous funding injected into the George Institute to continue academic research. And for the social enterprises, we have three sectors. Uh, one is a clinical research organization taking care of the pharma and medical devices uh, clinical trials before their commercialization. And the second arm is drug medicine, which is a pharma company, uh, mainly focused on the poly pills. Um, and third arm is George House Technologies, which is to commercialize our digital health solutions from the academic research into the market. And their profit will get in back to the George Institute to continually support our academic research. And um, in the last year, we are really glad uh, in a ranking system uh, from the Times. Uh, we have been ranked as the number one medical research institute in Australia, and the second in Asia Pacific regions, and the 33rd uh, in the world. Um, so our mission, I think that will be aligned with most of the people sitting in the room today, to, is to improve the health of millions of people worldwide. Uh, but I just I, uh, listed, uh, pointed out, in the next five years, we do have a 2025 strategy plans of the George Institute. And we'll mainly focus on three areas. So the first area is to finding the better treatment for the world's biggest health problems using innovative methodologies. And the second theme is to transform the healthcare services to deliver better healthcare for people around the world. As just like Nansen just indicated, primary health is the fundamental of the healthcare system. And the third theme is to harness the power of the governments, and markets, and communities to improve the health. Also, Nelson just indicated community engagement is a really key thing to develop the healthcare research. And this is just our locations of the George Institute. You see different colors. The purple color indicates the George Institute, which is the academic component of the George. Uh, which we have the headquarters in Sydney, in Australia, 
and invading two offices in India and one office in Oxford in the UK. And the green part is our social enterprise locations. They are pretty much very diverse around the globe. But it's a pretty big shame we don't have any offices located in South America. So this is the chance we have to develop the partnership to move the job into the South American regions. So this is just a pipeline of the George Institute China office, our development since, 2000, uh, since 2004. So the institute was established in 1999, and uh, we set up our office uh, in 2004, uh, but it is not a really legal entity in China. It's just like a project between Australia and Beijing to improve, the, uh, to, to set up the China-Australia partnership. But until three years later, in 2007, we established the George Institute China, which is a legal entity in China. And um, in 2009, uh, 2009, and 2000, uh, 2009, we received really big funding support from National Institute of Health from the USA and allow us to, con uh, to, uh, to work as a center of excellence uh, for chronic disease in China. So the funding allows us to work five years with NIH uh, in that time period. And in 2012, in China, we were official, officially affiliated with the number one medical, research, uh, medical institution in China, which is the Peking University Med uh, Health Science Center. And in 2014, uh, in particular given the emerging of the technologies to address the health problems, with the support of, of, from Qualcomm, we established the China Center for M Health Innovation. And uh, in 2016, we were collaborating with a national leading cardiology hospital in China to, uh, to harness our collaborations to strengthen our research in heart. And in 2018, given the Chinese uh, foreign NGO laws, we were uh, formally registered as a foreign NGO, and we are directly reporting to Beijing Health Commission uh, under this law. So this is just showing up some partners, some selected partners in our past 12 years in China. So that including some governments, government agencies, industries, uh, hospitals, uh, as well as the funding agencies across the globe. All right, so, uh, so that's, that's a really brief introduction of the George Institute. I uh, hope you have a uh, much more like uh, clear understanding of the organization we are doing in Sydney, in Australia, and across the across the world. So just before uh, I introduce in getting into health system introductions and the primary health care uh, health system introductions in China, I just give you some numbers about China. Uh, I think. Uh, as Nancy indicated, we are all like developing, big developing countries, but geographically, we are really far from each other. Uh, and, um, I, you know, there might be some information like in Brazil talking about China, but, you know, some information could be true and some information could be false. So I give you some uh, in-depth understandings of how the China looks like and what the healthcare system in China looks like. So. Like, this slide just shows you some demographic profile of China. But talking about population, uh, there's no doubt. China is the number one, is the most populous uh, country in the world. And the recent number is 1.4 billion people in this country. Uh, and basically what I really want to highlight is the yellow, uh, yellow highlight numbers. Uh, as you see, like, really similar to the other developing countries in the world, China is aging. So, and this trend is growing really, really fast. By 2030, we will be having 25% of our population aged 60, 60 years and above. So this is a really big problem for Chinese government and for the entire healthcare system. And the other number I really want to highlight is the urbanization of the country. If you look at the, the, the number on the last row of, uh, of this table, uh, back to 1980, there were only less than 20% of the population living in the urban cities. But now, in 2015, more than 50% of the 1.4 billion population they live in the urban cities. So that means, in the rural settings, 
still no P. <laughs> so there's more, less people are uh, living the rural side, and most of the people moving into the urban side, and that's caused a dramatic increase in the health systems in the urban side versus the rural side, and that's translate into inequality, health inequality issues between rural and urban, and the demographic profiles of people is changing between rural and urban as well. Most of the older people, they are living in the rural areas, where most of the young people, they are working in the urban areas. So this slide just show you uh, some uh, disease burden of China. And I use some data from the global burden um, uh, disease uh, studies to show you what the uh, disease pattern has been changed in the last decade. So if you look at these slides, you know, as, as very similar as the other developing countries, China is predominated by the non-chemical diseases. And the infectious disease um, is still a big problem, but it's not like as problematic as the non-chemical diseases. So stroke, is ischemic heart disease lying in the top two disease burdens in China. And if we look at the uh, most deaths and disability combined, if we look at the daily uh, indicator, still stroke, ischemic heart disease, COPD, is lying very in the uh, very top of the disease pattern. So basically, what the healthcare uh, health system uh, looks like in China uh, is sometimes, like in some points, is very similar as indicated in Brazil, but there's still some uh, differences between the countries. So Chinese healthcare system is a really hierarchy system. So this, the healthcare system coming from the national level. So in the national level, we do have the National Health Commission which is the equivalent of the Minister of Health in the other countries. Uh, and under the health, uh, National Health Commission, we have two entities. One is China CDC, National CDC, taking care of the most of the public health, care, uh, public health services. And the other is the national level hospitals to take care of the medical services. And one level below the national level, that's the provincial level. So really similar, in the provincial level, we do have the health commission as well as the provincial level CDC and hospitals. And one level be below that is the city level. Uh, very similar, but we change the name. It's not calling health commission anymore, it's the health bureau. So it's one level below the province level. And below city, that's the district or county levels. So this full system, uh, is um, basically is the um, combines the uh, tertiary uh, and second care services uh, in national, provincial, city, and district or county levels. So in the primary health care settings, uh, basically in this health care system, we have three systems. One is the public health delivery system is mainly divided distributed by the CDC networks, coming from the national down to the district and district levels. And the other system is the medical service delivery systems, which is mainly from the hospital settings, from national hospital, provincial hospital, city, and district and county hospitals. And the other system is the governing system. It is much more taken care of, delivered by the health commissions at different uh, uh, administrative levels. And in the primary health care, we divide it into urban and rural. So in the urban, we have sub-district level and community levels. And the corresponding health facilities, primary health facilities, is the community health center and the community health stations. And in the rural settings, we have township and village. And the corresponding primary health facilities is township hospital and the village clinics. And for the primary health care system, they are not really distinguished by the public health services or medical services. Basically, 
all those health facilities, they are taking care a combined of public health and medical service medical services together. So I'm just give you some numbers from different perspective of the health system, from the institutions, from the workforce, from the information technology, financing, and etc. Just give you a really bold idea what the primary healthcare system looks like in China. For the institutions, I have the number back to in 2016, we have a total number of 9,000 urban health centers, which is this part here. Um, and we have a, approximately 25,000 urban community health stations, but only 70% of them are public owned. And in the rural settings, we have 37,000 rural township hospitals, and basically all of them are public owned. And meanwhile, we have like more than 600,000 village clinics, but for the village clinics, only 60% of them are public owned. So in China, rural, rural village clinic is just like a private business. So basically, rural village clinic is function as a for-profit organization and with revenue generated primarily from the government subsidizes. And the rural villages, they are really independent and has a less informal relationship with the township hospital one level above them. So basically you can understand village clinic is just like private clinic. So they have to make money of running the clinics. The government will put in some money into the village clinic, but it is not the whole lot. So the healthcare providers in the rural settings they still have to think about how to make their business profitable. So that's a problem causing for the primary health care system, which I will be talking about later. So in terms of the workforce, in China, the primary health care work providers have three levels of medical training. They are called medical college, junior medical college, and technical school. So basically, the classification of those three levels depends on the years of education training, medical training. For example, the medical college, there are five years of medical, uh, medical education after 12 years of primary and secondary education, which they will obtain a bachelor degree. But for the technical schools, it's only three years of medical education after nine years of primary and secondary education. So this is quite different. And for the technical schools, they are only will be awarded as a diploma rather than as a degree. And for the licensed doctors or licensed assistant doctors, they have to complete at least the medical education or junior medical, uh, medical college and both of them needs to pass a national practicing doctor examination. But for the village doctor, while, wo while working in the village clinics, they are a little bit different. Uh, the qualifications for the village doctors are very, uh, very less than the other physicians. For the village doctors, they only need a technical school training or continuous practicing experience more than 20 years in the village clinics and they are, uh, they are will be entitled as a village doctor which means they have the right to prescribe medications in the village clinics however those doctors they are will only be practicing in the village clinics they are not allowed to prescribe at the other uh, healthcare facilities uh, and in 2015, we have a total number of 3,060 licensed doctors and uh, assistant doctors in urban areas, uh, but like double number uh, in the rural areas. And we have a, like a, a number close to one million village doctors working in the village clinics across the whole country. So that this slide shows you the quantity of the primary health workforce 
uh, in China. Uh, if you look at the blue part of this figure, it shows you the number of licensed doctors or assistant, assistant doctors per 1,000 mm -hmm. population. And the darker one, which is more doctors available, and the lighter one is less doctors. And this graph basically is really in line with the economical, uh, social economical levels of the whole country. <coughs> the more developed regions, they have more doctors, and less developed regions, they have less doctors. And uh, the, the red figure is basically showing the number of village doctors per a thousand population, and it's very similar pattern as the number of doctors. However, there is an exception for the vision doctors. If you look at the very dark red, that's the Tibet region, which has an average of four vision doctors per a thousand population. This is primarily because the population size in Tibet is very, very small. Um, and also, there's study showing the job satisfactions of the primary health care uh, physicians uh, in different regions of China. So this graph shows separated by the eastern part, the central part, and the western part. And they are representing different socioeconomical status. The eastern part is, which more, is more, much more developed regions. And central part is developing, but the western part is less developed. So you, you can see from this figure, for less developed regions, um, the social benefits for the primary health care physicians, they are getting less. So that's a really big problem in terms of how to sustain those primary health care providers, in particularly in those regions with less developed resources. If we look at the information system, the information system is developing really rapidly in the last decade. However, the only half of the urban community health centers and half of the rural township hospitals, um, they are equipped with the med uh, electronic medical system. Uh, and in the rural clinics, uh, of more than 90% of the rural clinics they do not have a electronic medical uh, record system. And only among those 8% who has the electronic medical record system, less than 40 of those private doctors, they do not use it routinely. Um, and uh, the linkage of the information system is very, very bad between the primary care settings with the hospitals. Uh, the majority of the information system, they are not connected, and they are not interoperated. So this is, um, uh, um, is, is the scheme. It's called National Essential Public Health Service Program. This is a universal health uh, services has been provided to all residents in China. So is this something really similar as the Universal Health Service program has been conducted in, in Brazil, but this program has some differences versus with the Brazilian model. Uh, so this program launched in 2009 and funded by the government and provided to all residents. And it's currently including, included 14 service items that including the health education, child health management, older people management, uh, hypertension, diabetes, uh, and etc. 14 service items. However, the implementation of su such service program is a lot of pro uh, problems. It's not like the Brazilian model, you are working as a coordinated team and a multidisciplinary team but the implementer of this national service program is only being implemented by one person uh, in one region. So for example, in a village setting, it's only being implemented by the village doctor in this village. And it is not a coordinated team by involving with the other 
physicians or specialists. And uh, if we're talking about the financing system in China, so basically we, um, we are pretty close to 100% health insurance coverage in China, but we still have a little bit of uh, 2% to work on. Uh, but basically in China, we have three social health insurance schemes, and they are divided by the rural and the urban settings. So there are two schemes in the urban, and one scheme in the rural. But from last year, the central government is trying to merge the rural and urban medical schemes, trying to reduce uh, the health equity issues between different settings. And we are looking at the quality of care. There is no model and there is no data showing how the primary health care system performance uh, from the literature. So we are only getting some numbers from the traditional epidemiological studies. So this is a study, this is a really big Chinese cohort involving half million people uh, in different parts of China, including rural and urban settings. And this cohort is uh, led by uh, the group at Oxford, Oxford University. So if we look at this pattern uh, of the figure here, uh, the prevalence of hypertension is above 30 percent uh, in the age population between 35 and 74. However, all of those population, only 30 percent were diagnosed, and of those diagnosed, only 40 percent were treated. And uh, of those treated, less than 30 percent were controlled. So that leading to an overall control rate before 5%. And if we look at the pattern for diabetes, very similar. So we have really high prevalence of diabetes in the, in the past few decades, rising from 1% in 1980 to 10% uh, at the moment, but leading to a very, very low control rate. So what's the challenges of the primary health care system in China? Some are really similar as Brazilian primary health care challenges, but some are unique. So in terms of the workforce, uh, as I indicated, uh, for the workforce, there are low training, low wages, and minimal benefits. So that leading to, it's not like the Brazil, like the developed country model, most of the physicians will be inspired to work as the primary care settings. But in China, people hesitate to work in the primary care settings. So for, um, a, for medical, for like a doctor has been received more than five years medical trainings, uh, their goal is to work in the big hospitals, but not in the primary care uh, centers. So the current payment policy is much more fee-for-service payment policies, models. Uh, so that leading to a really high quality of care delivered by the primary care systems. Uh, but the government is trying to move from fee-for-service model to value-based model. But we, you know, from the dynamics, we haven't really seen any specific action has been taking place in the primary care setting yet to shift from the fee service model to the value-based models. And we are talking about the information. There's a lot of information system has been uh, equipped in different levels of the healthcare system. However, they are quite fragmented and they are not integrated, not interoperable. Uh, so that leading to at different levels of the healthcare system, um, the, work, the patient's information is not shared, it's not connected. It is hardly to achieve a clear patient's referral pathway. And we're talking about the health uh, insur insurance policies, uh, insurance schemes, but the current health insurance policies provide very generous reimbursement for inpatient services. Uh, for example, for inpatient services, Patients can be reimbursed 
by up to 80% of the whole uh, entire medical cost. However, for the outpatient services, they can only receive less than 20% of the reimbursements. So basically, that encourages the patients to be more admitted in the hospitals rather than to go into the primary care settings to receive outpatient services. As I indicated, the quality of the primary care system is not well characterized. So the, the only available data is from the epidemiological data, and we're showing a really big gap in terms of the treatment and the control of the disease. And there is no strict gatekeeping policies, which means patients can go any healthcare facilities as they wish. Um, so basically, this is just a really broad uh, information describe the Chinese healthcare system, Chinese primary healthcare system. So which I hope you have you will be having some preliminary understandings of how the system looks like in another big developing countries in the other parts of the world. Thank you.